Okay, this is part two of MLA and plagiarism, keeping you honest. Okay, so um, more celebrities behaving badly. You know, I just really love these examples. Um, I don't know if you guys remember Omarion. He might have been more back in my day, but he came out. I remember one of his biggest hits was Ice Box with Timberland. Um, but he, if you are forgetting, he was also on uh, Love and Hip Hop. Um, Hollywood as well. So in any case, um, he had a song on this new album called The Only One, which would totally be fine, except for the fact that this guy, Marcus Anthony, actually did a mixtape with a song entitled You're the Only One. And Marcus Anthony um, is not some obscure person, even if he was an obscure person, he would still have every right um, to call a Marion out on this because of copyright law. And he would probably still win, but um, in a court of law. But Marcus Anthony is also a writer, producer, and background vocalist for Jamie Foxx. So he's pretty well known within the industry. His lyrics are as follows. So you can see this side by side here. Mark Anthony's song and Omarion's song. And if you just look from line to line, then you really see how, I mean, the text is pretty much the same. I mean, like hardly anything was changed at all. This is pretty much word for word. And um, the only real key word change I see is here. Instead of so many girls in here, that's also fine. I see so many girls in here that's also fly in the original. But again, um, you know, not really that big of a difference. Pretty much word for word. So if you get a chance to listen, the tracks also sound almost identical too, okay? Um, and tracks are copyrightable, just like words are. Um, and so copyright law protects a variety of things. Uh, words, um, music, uh, music production, um, plays, um, like as far as the, um, the, the writing goes. Um, in the script, um, you know, any scripts, um, anything like that, um, even drawings can be copyrightable just like words can. So, um, this is a blatant form of plagiarism and this is known as copyright infringement, which is a very suable offense. And I think a lot of people mistake a lot of beginners who are just starting out writing, you know, they think, oh my goodness, like their worst fear is that somebody else takes what they've, what they've written. And, um, you know, that could be potentially one of the best things to ever happen to you, especially if that person is famous, you know, more famous than you, because, um, you can sue them and get your money and they've, they will have made a lot of money for you already. Um, one of my, uh, writing professors um, taught me that. And I said, oh yeah, I guess that's not so bad. So again, what happened was it made me write without fear that somebody else would, you know, take my writing. Most likely um, Marcus Anthony will sue. Most likely he will win and he will get a nice percentage of a variety of things. Not only Omarion's record sales, if he allows him to use his song and lyrics and, you know, music production, radio spins, um, any other wages earned from licensing that song. And so when we, I talk to you guys and I'll say, oh, like, you know, my agent sold another book of mine. But when I say sell, I don't really mean sell. I mean license. So when you license something, you're licensing um, the, the ownership of it to someone else to use it um, to make money. For, for both of you. It's an, it's an agreement. And that's what a contract is. That's what a publishing contract is in literature, in the literary uh, industry, um, in, in writing and publishing. That's what music publishing contracts are as well. Other wages would include things like commercials, movie soundtracks, music videos. And if that track is sampled in any way, shape, or form, they would get paid for that as well. Um, if Mark, Marcus Anthony did not want to license his work, then Omarion would have to remove the song from his album and he would have no other choice. And this gets more complicated with songs because they're usually owned by multiple people. So this would get complicated really quickly. Um, for instance, um, you might be wondering what the difference is between a copyright, a patent, and a trademark. And let me just make this abundantly clear as well. This is something that you can do. I copyright my own work before the publisher copyrights it on my behalf. 
So there's two versions of my work that's copyrighted. There's the copyrighted version that for me is the original, and then there's the copyrighted version of my work that um, once we're done editing with the editor at the publisher and they've already purchased licensing to the book, then when we're done and this the writing is in the final stage that it's going to be in when the book comes out, the publisher copyrights it um, on my behalf at that point as well. So copywriting is something that you can do. You just go to copyright.gov and that website will walk you through all the steps. It's very simple. I taught myself how to do it. You can do it too. You can copyright anything that you write, anything. Um, and there's a small fee associated with it. It costs $35. It used to be a little less, but now it costs $35 to copyright each thing. Um, that's copywriting, okay? And then there's a patent. A patent is what you see on Shark Tank, right? When someone comes up with an invention, Lori deals with patents quite a bit because she sells things on QVC and she's really, really good at that. So a patent is something that protects an invention of your own making. And then a trademark is something that's really good for protecting a brand, like a logo or something to that effect so that nobody else can use it. So copyright protects works of original authorship. A patent protects inventions or discoveries. And trademarks protect words, symbols, phrases, you know, taglines, slogans, or designs pertaining to goods or services. So if you were to start your own company and you were to design a logo, you can trademark that logo so that nobody else can come along and use that logo and kind of take over. Okay, so this brings to mind the stuff that we discussed in the first lecture. So what about the songs that have been sampled? A sample is an identifiable likeness or sameness of an original work. And there are many artists who do this. Um, you know a ton of artists who do this. Um, hip hop is in the, the genre of hip hop is infamous for this. And you know that Kanye West, um, especially when he first came out with his first album, he sampled. I mean, he was really good at sampling, just brilliant at it. Um, but many, many producers do this. Um, and this is the example that I chose to use um, the song Very Special. Um, when I was updating this, at the time, K. Michelle had a new single that came out called VSOP. And um, it was a sample from Deborah Law's song. And Very Special has been sampled so many times. So that's why I use this example because I said, wow, people are still sampling this song. I mean, it's a really good song. Um, but these are other samples and remakes. You can see all the way from Mary J. Blige's 1992 album, What's in a 411 all the way to 2013. And these are just the ones that I could think of off the top of my head, but I'm sure that there are many, many other samples out there of this song. It's very popular in pop and um, hip hop and rap. Um, when you hear these types of samples, in most cases, the music and the words have been licensed to another party, which means that all parties acknowledge ownership and permission for use of the work. Now, this is talking about music as an example, but this happens um, all the time in publishing as well. So when we're talking about books, um, when I license my copyright to the publisher, that means that the publisher and I enter into a business marriage, okay? So that every time money is made on the sale of the book, it accrues money for both of us. And because I write a lot of picture books, um, there's another, there's a third member in this business marriage, and that is the illustrator. So every single time money is made, the publisher gets paid, and then the publisher divides up the money and gives me some of the money and gives the illustrator some of the money. So that's how this works. So if one of us makes money off of the book, all three of us make money off of the book. And that's just the way it is. That's the agreement. Um, and so that's what licensing means. It works the same way in music. Um, the way the publishing industry works and the way that the music industry works are very, very similar. Um, so they work out the residuals, okay, which are the royalties. We So in music, they call them residuals. But in... in um, I mean, you can, and there these these terms are interchangeable. But I've heard more people call them residuals dealing with music, and then in publishing we call them royalties. So we work out these royalties and these percentages ahead of time, um, and it's all completely legal. 
Um, and it doesn't mean that copyrights can't change hands. So that's another important point. Copyrights are things that you can sell like stocks. And the more popular the work is, the more the copyright is worth. Okay, so for original creators of artistic works, this is usually a no-no. I mean, just imagine J.K. Rowling, who's a billionaire. Imagine her um, selling her copyright to Harry Potter, right? I mean, it just sounds ridiculous. But this actually happens all the time. It actually happens a lot in music where copyrights are bought and sold and exchange and they exchange many, many hands. And this is how the real money is made. So for instance, in 1984, um, Michael Jackson purchased the entire Beatles catalog for $47.5 million, which would be the equivalent to something around 106 million now. And given the time that I made this PowerPoint, probably be a little bit more than that. <laughs> okay. This meant that MJ could license the Beatles music and make a publisher's fee of 50%. So he actually sat down um, with his friend here and it was actually um, this Beatles member that taught Michael Jackson that, um, that you could even do that. And um, he sat down and he said, here, I want you to look at this book. And he had him like flipping through, you know, the book and you know, Michael Jackson said, what is this? And he said, this is how the real money is made in music. These are all copyrights to all these different songs. And this is how you really make money, you know? And so Michael Jackson said, well, I'm going to own the Beatles catalog one day. And then, um, yikes, he actually did. And um, so they kind of stopped being friends. But in any case, this meant that Michael Jackson could license their music and, or make a publisher's fee of 50%. And that's very typical that the publisher gets 50%. The publisher gets half of whatever the total amount is that's earned and then the rest is divided up between the other people okay so um <clears throat> paul mccartney was the one who taught him this and so lennon and mccartney still get paid for writing the songs which is around 25 percent each but they have no say over licensing over their work because they don't have the publishing rights or at least they didn't at that time um since then mccartney has been able to repurchase the catalog and so now it's under his control Ironically, though, like I said, it was McCartney who taught Michael Jackson about purchasing catalogs and music in the first place. So when words are licensed, the creator and publisher makes a residual wage. But if the content is used to promote the product, like a book review or something like that, a music review, then it's considered acceptable use or more specifically fair use. Now, this is important for you because it means that you're able to write a paper for academia use quotes from other sources and it's still considered to be fair use you're not plagiarizing if you're giving credit to where credit is due so that's why we have to include a work cited page that's why we have to include um, bibliographies that's why we have to include quotes and in-text citations and um, in-text citations for paraphrases and summaries because all of this is considered fair use um, fair use would also include, for example, when a DJ spins songs in a public space. So there are some occasions where this has been questionable, okay, um, as well, like in very expensive, um, popular clubs where DJs make thousands of dollars a night. Sometimes clubs that rely upon music and DJs to bring people in and they make a lot of money. Sometimes clubs are required to pay a licensing fee so that the music can be played. Um, but in smaller venues, this just isn't feasible. It's unreasonable. And so it doesn't happen. Um, lastly, what about all the remakes of things like Little Red Riding Hood, The Three Bears, Cinderella, Snow White, right? We've seen these things to death. You go into any bookstore, you're going to look at the children's section and you're going to see tons of remakes of all of these um all of these books right and the characters from these books who owns the rights to those right um so these types of works are recognized as being in the public domain um the public domain includes works that are not restricted by copyright and require no license or fee to use if something's in the public domain it means that the copyright has probably expired so things like this um Anything like ideas and facts, um, government works and documents, 
things that are created and assigned to the public domain by their creators, 